before I start, I have to just give a couple of um, sort of declarations. One is my training is in on medical oncology, and so mostly, almost all the examples that I'm using are in are based in oncology, and that's basically what I do. So uh, I have done some cardiovascular and some metabolic studies, but primarily what I'm going to be speaking about is oncology. Um, the second thing is I'm not a statistician, as you'll know, but I've had the good fortune of working with some very good ones, uh, both at Pfizer as well as at Novartis and BMS. And I think what, what's been impressed upon me is really that given the kind of problems that we're facing clinically in terms of developing our drugs, um, I'm fortunate in the group that I'm in here at Pfizer and in our early development group that we are actually very open to using novel ideas and novel ways of thinking about things. And for example, the whole discussion in dose escalation, we have one trial that's using MTPI, we have one trial that's using CRM. We've gotten away from using 3 plus 3, and so in our group at least, I think we are very open to um, thinking about what other ways we can do this better. So having said that, I'm going to um, first talk a little bit about um, and just give a very high overview again from a clinical perspective or a clinical oncology perspective about the drug development uh, paradigm in a sense. And then specifically talk about POC or clinical uh, proof of concept and, and talk about defining it because I think it really, um, it's, if you ask you know, 10 different people in early development what POC means, you're likely to get about six different answers because it really is um, it, different from perspective that you're coming from. And it may be that they're all six of them are correct based on where they're coming from. And then talk about why, again, in the exploratory or early development phase, why there's now been a, an emphasis on POC more than it was just a few years ago when I began in, in this field. Um, and, 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 and there's some very interesting data from an economic standpoint, from, from patient selection standpoint as to why this is happening. And then talk a little bit about patient selection strategies and some uh, considerations for adaptive designs and things like this, and then end up with some sort of practical implications that we face from the clinical side um, in trying to implement some of these great statistical ideas. So this is just an overview again of, of the uh, entire pathway in terms of the drug development starting from the preclinical through registration, and I think it's just, uh, I wanted to start with this just to show that, you know, my, I, the, what, we're, what I'm going to be focusing on today is um, you know, proof of concept. And again, in oncology, it typically happens during phase two. So phase one in oncology, and most many of you might know who are, who are in this field, you know, it's, it's primarily a safety. You're, you're trying to establish your safety and tolerability. Sometimes we look at different regimens that we want to look at um, to try and get to either a, a biologically active dose, what we think might be a biologically active dose, or an MTD. And then the proof of concept is really where sort of the, uh, the meat of the, the matter is, because basically what we get, want to get from here is enough of a confidence to go forward in phase three, which is, is, is very expensive. And so the, the problem really goes back to when you look in, in, the, you know, in the databases in the last 10, 15 years, even though we've had some tremendous scientific breakthroughs and advances in, in understanding of, of diseases, especially in oncology, if you look at the overall success rate, meaning, you know, from compounds that get in first in demand all the way through registration, it's about 11 percent. And, and if you look in oncology, it's actually, it's, it's quite low. It's about only 5 percent. And so um, there's actually, you know, obviously a great amount of attrition that's, that's, that's occurring, and attrition in terms of, against the pharmaceutical industry means money and lots of money. So that's definitely a, a problem, and, and that's, that's been identified. And then if you look at it further, if you look at it by which phase of development this typically occurs in, in terms of the attrition, you can see again that, um, you know, phase one, the, the, this is a success rate across the different indications here are the therapeutic areas. You can see it's about, you know, 60 or 70 percent, meaning that those compounds that enter phase one then successfully get into the next phase, which is phase two. And then you can see here in phase two where um, the, the success rate here across therapeutic areas is, is obviously drops down. And that might, that ties into a little bit about why we think these things are failing. And you can see that they're primarily based on efficacy. And then you, I think it's, it's to me, this, you know, the most informative part of all this is that you get all the way through registration and still, if you look at oncology here, only about, um, about 70 per, you only have a success rate of 70% even after you've finished your phase three. So that means that 
once you've spent all this money to get through your phase three into registration, you still have a chance that that's not going to succeed. So um, obviously there's places for improvement in all of these phases. And this boils down to, uh, you know, at the end of the day is, you know, how much is this costing? And this is, again, based in, uh, from numbers from 2009, but I think it's representative of, of the overall um, scheme, which is that the vast majority of the, um, the 40% the, the of the costs are basically incurred in phase three. And this is across different uh, tumor, uh, therapeutic areas, but this is representative in oncology as well. Um, and you can, if you combine the phase two and phase three share of the total cost, it's, it's over half, the, um, it's over 50%. So what are the ways that you know, people have thought about in terms of addressing this attrition? And so some of them I think may be obvious in a way, maybe more you know, in terms of more, having more predictive preclinical efficacy models, which is, um, again, from a clinical perspective, it, we tend to sort of think you can just snap your fingers and have a better efficacy model for, for lung cancer, for example, and obviously that's not the case. But that is uh, one thing is to get better compounds into phase one so that you have better compounds going in through phase three. The other is something, you know, I, trying to identify and, and improve on proof of mechanism in early trials. I think, you know, in, I've been a part of lots of programs, and I'm guilty just as anyone else, where we, we put in a proof of concept criteria, and then when we don't get it, we sort of, you know, sort of look at it and say, well, we're almost there, you know, there's too much uncertainty, we'll just go ahead. So the idea is, you know, are there ways that, again, knowing that, understanding that we, we've have a better sense sometimes of the biology and the mechanism of action of our new compounds, they can be built in earlier um, sort of um, stop criteria based on uh, lack of proof of mechanism. And then toxicities, you know, someone brought up, I think this is always a balance. In oncology, I think we're fortunate in a sense because in, in terms of development that we have uh, more leeway in terms of therapeutic index versus a lot of other indications. And um, however, now with, with the newer agents coming up that are more targeted, that have less um, toxicity um, effects, I think the expectation even clinically is that the compounds that come into the clinic now, the, the level of tolerance for um, grade three, four tox is lower than it was with cytotoxic chemotherapies. I mean, the whole idea was with cytotoxic chemotherapies, you're willing to uh, treat a patient through these very severe toxicities, but with the, with the uh, targeted agents where we don't see that, you know, that we're having to take into consideration that much more. And so one of the other ways to reduce the attrition in the overall drug development process is to design POC trials or clinical proof of concept that provide not only the evidence that you're inhibiting the target, um, but also evidence that, that hitting that target results in a meaningful physiologic response or in... in in oncology terms, a, re a partial response or, or extending um, stable disease or something like that. And so this goes to, you know, how do you define proof of concept? And I think, like I mentioned, it means different things to different people, but I, I like this definition because I think it encompasses w the tr true sense of this, which is that it's the earliest point in drug development where the evidence, weight of evidence suggests that it's reasonably likely that the key attributes for success are present and the key causes of failure absent. So it leaves it very open um, because it is such a hard thing to define. And, you know, and I've, at Pfizer, when I first started, we used to have these very sort of tight criteria as to what our POC criteria needed to be, regardless of the mechanism of action, regardless of the type of um, indication we were going in. And I don't think that that was really useful for each individual program. And so I think if you use a, a sort of a more um, holistic definition like this, this is really what it's getting to. And what the result of the POC is, at least in terms of pharmacy, pharmaceutical, and I think most big companies are like this, is that that really triggers the commitment from the organization to go to phase three. And at least in, in cancer, you know, our phase three is now, for one phase three, it's about 90 to $100 million dollars. That, that it costs just to run that trial. And so it's a huge commitment from, for the organization to say, yes, we believe enough, of this, enough of, in this compound to, to go for the next step. And so, from a, you know, so to bring it back now to the proof of concept, you know, what are the overall goals that we'd like to have when we get through the proof of concept, realizing, again, that the next step is this big commitment into phase three. And so just, you know, this is... Um, we had um, Fred, Fred Emmerman, who's one of our statisticians in our group, gave a talk on this. And 
I think he sort of very nicely put it down into, you know, what is the goal of POC? We'd like to know the best dose and regimen. Uh, we'd like to know which indications we want to go into. We'd like to know which patients will respond. And then, importantly, what, what's the degree of efficacy? And because all of these are going to be used in order to make a determination of how to design our phase three studies and, and um, from a commercial standpoint, how, how to use that information further. And so this, I don't know if this came out very well, but again, <clears throat> the other thing about you know, POC is it, the criteria that we use, especially from, from our side, from the clinical side, is, is obviously efficacy. We, we need to see a certain efficacy bar. Either it's, it's typically not response rate, but it's PFS or OS or something. But in, in actuality, the, POC, the essential information for going into a POC determination can be very important and, and can be um, very diverse. So you, not only are you looking at efficacy, but obviously you're looking at um, the PD, PKPD, the dose and regimen. Um, at, this is a part when the formulation and manufacturing issues come into play, especially for biologics these days and the cost of goods. Um, and we talked a little bit about the safety. The, the one point was about the commercial. So POC is also a very important milestone from a commercial standpoint because this is when the commercial group is able to sort of focus on how this will be differentiated in the clinic, um, more and more how it will be reimbursed, not just in the U not just ex-U.S., but even in the U.S. now we're, we're hearing that insurance companies and third-party payers are not paying or not reimbursing um, like they used to in the past, so it's getting to be a much more uh, important issue. Um, and obviously, regulatory as well. This is once you get to POC, the regulatory um, group has to uh, get involved in terms of what, which indications, whether they're approvable or not, are the endpoints acceptable for, um, again, not just the FDA, but XUS, because obviously now most of our programs are global. And then the other, I think, important point that we spend a lot of time on in our group is, you know, what is the decision criteria for POC? It's nice to have all of these. Um, it's nice to think about all these different um, ways that POC matters, but at the end of the day, if you don't have a really good decision criteria that's very clear, that's agreed upon by everybody, then that's what gets to problems later on. And so this is just an example of how, how we do things, or um, which is to, to look, you know, just pre a priori before, the, before we even get the study approved, we have negotiations with the late stage group, with even commercial and marketing, to come up with the criteria for POC that, that's agreeable to everybody, meaning that if we, you know, if we get to, if we are able to achieve this criteria, then it, we're going forward into the phase three study. And in terms of oncology POC trials, again, there's no really one size fits all. I think that typically we like to do um, randomized studies and it, just because I think it gives us a better sense of confidence that what you're seeing is a, a true signal. But there are cases where we've done single arm trials for POC where, for example, in, um, we had a compound that was in early stage breast cancer, so in the neoadjuvant setting, where <clears throat> it was a biological endpoint that was thought to be a POC type endpoint and that, and that was able to be done with a single arm experience. I think the endpoints also are a great um, point of discussion. Obviously, ideally, you'd like to have the same endpoints in your POC study that you were going to have for phase three and for registration. Sometimes, again, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of a, a program now, again, in first-line metastatic breast cancer where you know, the median PFS is getting to be about 20 months. And so if you're thinking about doing a POC study with PFS as an endpoint in that setting, you're talking about a four or five year clinical trial before you even think about getting into phase three. And with the competitive nature that we're in, we're trying to see other composite endpoints. Are there other endpoints that would give us enough of a confidence that, that, that they would predict enough for, um, for, for OS, but, uh, but wouldn't take as long? So that's always something that we've uh, been struggling with as well. And typically in you know, most randomized phase two studies, these are, uh, we typically settle on, on this kind of statistic, statistical power and with about 75 to 100 patients per arm is sort of where we've been settling on the, the last few years in the POC studies that I've been involved with. 
You know, I was saying before, you know, when, when people have looked at the specific reasons within phase two or POC studies, why they fail, you can see that a majority of them are due to lack of efficacy. Um, and so the, so obviously the, the thoughts are, you know, how do we improve upon this so that we can uh, improve the overall attrition rate? And so, again, in oncology, with, with the recent tr um, types of compounds that are coming out, which are more targeted, we are developing drugs now which we know what the target is and we, we think that, at least on preclinical models, that if you inhibit this target, you should have a good response. So there's been a big push, um, not just at Pfizer, but at every company now, is to do patient selection strategies in order to try and improve um, phase two success. And this basically boils down to trying to identify patients who are most likely to respond. And this could be a bio, bio biomarker based on tissue sampling, but it could also be, I mean, I could also envision looking at sort of patient characteristics rather than something um, tissue-based. So, for example, you know, in, if you look at the EGFR mutation in lung cancer, there's a very um, definite type of patient that has a higher preponderance of that mutation. So it's the Asian non-smoking women in their 30s. And so if you can enrich your patient population based on clinical characteristics, that could be just as useful as um, basing it on a tumor marker. But obviously, you know, this audience doesn't need to uh, be convinced, but it, this has been shown to lead. The idea is you could do smaller sample size. You could, you could um, on, on the hypothesis that you'd have a greater effect size, and so that would lead to doing smaller trials. And importantly, from a clinical standpoint, it would avoid treating lots of patients who don't have an opportunity to uh, benefit from it. The three, I think, main factors, though, in, in terms of how successful or not you might be are, one is, again, this may be stating the obvious, but it's un unbelievable when you're talking in, in clinical settings or in you know, upper management how these sort of things people don't really think about, which is, okay, what's the prevalence of the marker? I mean, it's a big difference if you're talking about 2% of ovarian cancer versus 80% of ovarian cancer that have the marker. So your strategy is going to change, obviously, quite dramatically for that. The second thing is the effect size. Like I said, if, you, if your response rate only improves from 20% to 25%, that's a very different approach than if it's moving from 20% to 80% in your selected population. And then the third part, which is through um, my experiences very recently, um, it has been about the diagnostic assay. I think that, again, if we're using, if we are expecting to use um, tumor markers or circulating markers, there is a very long and arduous uh, diagnostic assay component that needs to be thought about very early when you first get into the clinic. And um, that, I think, again, is just starting to get appreciated now um, because of, of experiences. And then, you know, in terms of, Patient selection strategies, again, is when I think people think of it in different ways. So obviously there's a way you could do it would be prospective selection. So you'd only treat patients that have the biomarker and exclude patients that don't have the biomarker. And this, of course, requires great confidence that the biomarker is predictive of outcome. And honestly, with all the biology and all the understanding that we have of different signaling pathways, I, I can, you could probably name on one hand in oncology how many, you know, that how many biomarkers there are that have really been, been proven or validated to be predictive of outcome. Um, and we went through this exercise with this. And um, it's, it's, so that's really something that needs to be um, thought about very carefully. In terms of the retrospective analysis, I think this was raised before, which is, you know, the danger is that, again, based on the prevalence and your effect size, there's a very good chance that you may be diluting out your actual response that you might be having. And so it brings us down to the adaptive designs that we've been talking about some this afternoon, which is, I think, why there's a lot of great interest and excitement, at least within our group, about trying to incorporate some of these novel designs as we go forward um, in, in, our, in our trials. And this is just a, I found this very interesting. So there's this uh, review paper where they actually looked at prior examples of <clears throat> how patient selection strategies were done and tried to uh, put a dollar value on it. And basically, the, the, they looked at two different um, scenarios in, within cancer. One was Herceptin or Trastuzumab, which is uh, for um, HER2 positive breast cancer, in which case, at least in the adjuvant setting, the development was done in a prospective way. So they only selected patients who were HER2 positive. 
and, and they did their trials that way. The other um, scenario that they examined was, some, was panitumumab, which is an EGFR inhibitor that was approved for colorectal cancer. But it was, a true, it was approved for colorectal cancer in EGFR positive patients. But after it was approved, they found out that actually patients whose tumors were KRS uh, mutant did not, um, that, that the drug was ineffective in those patients. And so the label got changed after it got approved. And, um, and, 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 and basically, they, they use that as an example of sort of a retrospective a way of doing patient selection, meaning you get you get approved in the big all comers, and then you go back and you uh, find a, a you know patient selection strategy. And just the take home point was if you <clears throat> just look at the graphs that the biomarker only strategy, if you look at the ENPV, which is the effective um, 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 and ENPV is I always get these. Thank you, my present value. I don't use these very often, uh, but you can tell basically the take-home point is that the um, that the uh, biomarker-only strategy comes out ahead in terms of their analysis that they did, and they did a lot of. Um, um, some of you may be very familiar, much more familiar with this than I am, because they used a lot of modeling, they used a lot of simulations in this in this article. Um, so anyway, just the point being that the the prospective uh, way is, is seems to be a better way of doing things in terms of net present value. And then I think that this is also an interesting um, example was in, in, in um, cancer again is from first line non-small cell lung cancer. Um, gefitinib, which is a, um, again an EGFR inhibitor, when, when it first came out back in I guess in the late 90s, there was a lot of excitement because it was thought to be the first targeted agent that it was going to be um, you know, in lung cancer, which there was really being treated with standard chemotherapy, as you can see in the top. So they did uh, all comers um, phase three studies. And you can see here the number of patients that were enrolled. And there were four different phase three studies, one, two with gefitinib and two with erlotinib, which was uh, another EGFR inhibitor. You can see the numbers of patients that it took. And eventually, um, there was no improvement versus chemotherapy. So neither gefitinib nor erlotinib got approved in first-line lung cancer. What they did was, though, when they retrospectively took a look at those patients, they found that actually in, in patients that had EGFR mutations in their lung cancer, that those patients actually had a higher response rate than the overall population. So then they went back and they did prospectively, they only did EGFR positive mutated uh, patients. And you can see that the, you can see, first of all, the effect size in the selected population. And, and you can see, again, in this translated into progression-free survival and overall survival. And interestingly, you can see the sample size of what they needed to get this done. So it's, this is sort of a, a, um, a very good example, I think, as a teaching point to say that this potential for, for selecting patients really is. And then this sort of leads to, I guess I have to plug Pfizer a little bit, is um, the Krizotnip story or the Alex story, where very early we found that, that, that um, the team found that patients who had ALK rearrangements in their, in their lung cancer did tremendously well in their first studies. And so the entire development program for that compound has been limited to those patients who have the ALK rearrangements. And you can see how well they've been doing. And they, that compound got approved last year. And, and subsequent to that, there's a Novartis compound called Seritinib. but also got approved in second line. So, uh, so the, just... The, Again, just to sort of take home, make home the point about the adopt, adoptive POC studies, is it's very hard sometimes, especially with novel agents and novel targets, to know whether the biomarker is going to be predictive of outcome. And that's almost a, sort of a catch-22, because you really don't know if it's predictive until you do the phase three study. So you're only sort of guessing from, from preclinical models and from similar compounds. And so it's very difficult to think prospectively to commit to that. Um, also, this has been more and more of a, a, an issue, which is that health authorities now are also requiring at some point in your development that you at least show that the, the compound doesn't work in the biomarker negative patients. And so um, that's something that we always have to keep in mind. And of course, by, um, by not doing a retrospective view, you could avoid diluting the signal. And so this, I think, is my second to last slide or my last slide because 
this sort of comes down to, you know, what are the practical considerations? And again, I think that um, these are things that when, you know, I'm writing a protocol or, or talking to investigators or talking more with the operations people about the operational feasibility, these are the kind of things that, that always come up. So one of them is, you know, uh, if you're using a tissue-based biomarker for patient selection, um, in solid tumor patients, it's very difficult, no matter what people tell you, to get serial biopsies, to even get a baseline biopsy. It, you may be able to do it, but it's going to affect your accrual time. It's going to affect the type of patients that you get on study. Um, so that, and I think there's been a lot of um, very interesting work trying to find surrogate markers of circulating DNA or circulating tumor cells to get around this. <clears throat> the other point, as I mentioned before, was about the need for CLIA certified assays for patient selection. And, you know, we've, this is actually a regulatory issue where if you're using the assay to select patients for therapy, then the FDA requires you to file, file an IDE, which requires more paperwork and, and sort of more planning from, from the very beginning. So that's something that is, is being looked at. I think this is something which is, again, a universal problem with novel targets and novel compounds is when you're trying to, um, trying to stratify, you know, what are your cutoffs for biomarker expression? And you can, you, can, you can imagine that that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you don't have outcomes data. So you don't know what's your high and low. And so in the, in the programs that I'm dealing with right now, we've sort of arbitrarily gone to sort of tortiles and saying, if, you know, we'll take these, the top third as being high expressors medium expressors and low expressors. And um, of course, that'll be have, have to be validated in the clinic in the subsequent studies. But um, this is something that, and it's very, very tricky because I think, that, you know, based on preclinical data, it's very, I think, risky to, to put too much into that. Um, the prevalence issue that we talked about, you know, typically the way we've been addressing this is to go and try and get um, tissue samples from uh, tissue banks. The problem there is, as a lot of time is, um, again, something very practical issue is a lot of the tissue banks have tissues that are from patients that diagnosis, so they're sort of their primary tumors. But when we do our phase two studies and our POC studies, most likely we go in patients that have metastatic disease or end stage disease. And the question is always, when you're treating a patient um, in phase two, it, whatever marker you're looking for, is it the same? Is it consistent with what they had at diagnosis? Because, you know, there's, they call it antigen drift. And for HER2 and for some other markers, they've looked at that where when you look at patients' samples from, from diagnosis to metastasis, they oftentimes change. And so trying to sort of pin down what the prevalence is can be very tricky because not, not only are you looking at the prevalence in the tumor type, but you may be looking at what stage of disease are you looking at, and the prevalence might change in different stages. Um, again, the correlation between outcome is, is something we talked about. And then the, the last point is, you know, with these adaptive designs, um, any time that you're doing a large clinical trial, and so all of these are, are typically we do, I don't know, 25 or 30 sites, um, global studies, it's very difficult to have a long, prolonged um, stoppage. If, if, because if it's going to take you six months to analyze the data before you can tell, you know, which way to go, um, that's when you basically are in a lot of trouble because the, the sites for them to just stop everything and not think about your study for six months and then six months later to all of a sudden get started again and start putting patients on. It's, it's a very, very uh, significant problem. So I think that you know, these, these adaptive trial designs, we, we need to figure a way to either use different endpoints from what we want, you know, a quicker endpoint or um, to do it in a way that that doesn't slow down or doesn't stop accrual, ideally. So in summary and conclusion, uh, what, what I've been talking about is really what the problem is that's being trying to be addressed is what the high cost of attrition in phase three. And this is shifting the emphasis to, to trying to design better phase two trials and obviously better compounds coming into the clinic. But for our group is to think about how we can improve our phase two POC studies. Um, and uh, along with that is, is, like I mentioned, the POC component. Actually, our group, that's our whole remit, is to get compounds from first in human through POC. And so we obviously spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, 
and based on that, you know, in, in, as I mentioned, because of the types of compounds we are developing now and the types of drugs that are coming up through the, through the pipeline, there's really been, has been a, a significant shift towards more pro prospective patient selection. And um, this actually, I think, has finally sort of filtered up to our senior management where now they fully expect that we'll be coming with them you know, in, a, in a selected patient population and not an all-commerce population. Um, and that's why I think that's led to, at least in our group, a very um, high level of interest in looking at different study designs to be used and how to incorporate the biomarker data. Um, and then finally, just a reminder that, you know, and all of this practical considerations need to be addressed because ultimately, if you can't get the study done or if it's going to take you four extra years to do the study, then um, it may be the best design, but it may not ultimately prove its worth. And these are just the references. Thank you.